Hello, that's a second tutorial about stable projectors. In the previous one, I've described how to install it and how to plug in different neural networks into it. But once you've got them ready here and in the control nets, we are ready to start checking out the stable projectors itself. Let's uh, maximize the window so that it's large and easy to work with and have a look at the overall structure. It consists of three parts. The left panel, which contains the prompt, very similar to web UI. You are describing to the neural network in text what you want it to produce. You can select the neural network modal so that it can generate images in a specific art style. In my case, Arthemy Comics. Different kind of sampling methods, how many iterations you want to do. 10 is good for checking out and 20 is good for final results. The resolution of each image and how many images you want to generate at once, which is the batch size. If your GPU is not powerful, keep it very little so that GPU is producing one image at a time, and here is how many times you want it to produce it. So for example, doing it twice, four images at a time, is going to give you a total of eight images. CFG scale is how much do you want the neural network to be forced to listen to the prompt and uh, to be less creative. So pushing it here really, really forces it to be listening to the text, but seven is a good default value. Right-clicking on any kind of sliders resets it to the default value. So here, 7 is the default value, which is very useful if you've been playing around with sliders and want to revert them. That's the first panel, and it's always going to remain the same. Uh, the second panel, the right one, will show different stuff depending on what you've selected here. Currently, there are four different sections or tabs. The 3D Objects panel allows you to see your 3D models. You can click Load Model and uh, grab one of the models that I've provided with the stable projectors from the Test Meshes directory. For example, the gate. Notice that they have to be in the OBJ format. And if your model consists of different pieces or different meshes, you'll have them visible here. So you can click on the arch, the door, the stones, or the hinges, or holding control you can select all of them, or just click this All button. Global scale allows you to magnify the modal, but keep it at 1 in most cases. An important thing to mention is you can only import one single modal at a time, but it can consist of different meshes. And if it does, make sure that your meshes don't have overlapping UVs. Their UVs have to be spread out, they shouldn't be uh, overlapping each other, and that's a standard requirement by software like Substance Painter or Mari. Therefore, there is no surprise. Unique UVs, single modal, although different meshes are allowed. Next, let's look at the control nets. The control nets tab allows you to expand any kind of control unit you want to enable. And by default, when texturing 3D models, you want to have the control net with a depth modal. And for any kind of additional effects, you can enable other control net units and specify different neural network for the control net. But at least one with a depth is a must. And if you have low VRAM, you can tick this box if your GPU isn't powerful. But that's going to reduce the generation speed. Next is the Arts Background. That's where you're going to have 2D images generated to be the background of your 3D model. You can load them from file or just hit Generate Backgrounds to create them. And then finally, the Art is where you're going to have textures or like projections that are being landed on the 3D model itself. And you're able to bake ambient occlusion for your model. So I'm going to disable the wireframe and you can see that we're getting ambient occlusion. You can right click it and change the visibility as necessary or play around with the, um, with the brightness of it to make it less bright or more bright. Right clicking on them will once again reset them to the default value and ambient occlusion has two more options. So you can either shine it from the above to have darker areas from below and brighter on the above or if you untick it, it's going to be more uniform. So like going to be coming from all the directions. It's especially visible on stuff like barrels and uh, different objects. Maybe not as visible here. Lastly, the button here allows you to blur the ambient occlusion or have it more crisp. So I've unticked the blur and you can see it's now much more crisp. At the end of the generation, it's doing dilation so that the ambient occlusion looks even better and is of even higher quality so that there are no seams. And it's happening automatically. For now, let's get rid of any kind of ambient occlusion. I'm going to right-click and hit Delete. And in the positive prompt, we'll specify what I want to see. So I'm going to enable the wireframe and specify that I want to have Masterpiece, column 1.3 to really make it apparent and stand out from the remaining keywords that I'll provide. And I'll specify for the remaining ones a dungeon door 
hand painted, comma, art station, comma, highly detailed. Because these particular keywords, if I were to Google them, they would uh, result in beautiful images. And because neural networks were trained on billions of such images, the combinations and the generation that they're going to do is going to be pulled more towards these keywords. And I want to push it away from anything that's bad. So like smudge, low quality art, mediocre art, blur. I don't want to see any kind of hands or humans, animal. But don't overdo it, because if you do it too much, you're going to constrain the neural network and it's going to be afraid of doing anything. So maybe twice more than this, but not more. For now, I'm going to keep it simple. And with the modal Arthemy Comics selected, with the resolution 512 by 512, 20 iterations, sampling steps, I'm going to do four images once. From this angle, I'm going to look at my gate here and hit Generate Art. You can see that because I'm in the Arts tab right here, I'm seeing straight away the result of four images. The progress is being shown at the bottom here, and the estimated time of arrival, how much it's going to take, is here. You can reduce the frequency so that we query about the progress less, and that way if we keep it, for example, at 30 or 0, then we're not going to be bothering the stable diffusion about, hey, tell us the progress of how it looks like again and again. And uh, it might appear stuck, but in fact it's going to complete quicker. Otherwise you can just keep uh, querying it as normal, uh, at 100%, and it will be reporting the progress more frequently, but might complete it slightly longer. So we've got four different beautiful variants that we can select from. Gosh, they're really awesome. This one, for example. And if we need to, we can right-click and change the hue. Right-click to reset saturation and the value to make it brighter or darker, and the contrast, because that will really come into play when we'll have to blend between projections uh, from different angles. So we have currently these four. If I Alt, left click and drag, I can orbit around my modal and position it to be something like this. Now I'm going to keep the same description and going to generate the art once again. So another generation is going to be coming into play. While it's doing so, let's have a look at how we can navigate the viewport uh, of uh, stable projectors. So I've already explained that Alt, left click and dragging will orbit the currently selected objects in the 3D Objects tab. Right click and uh, dragging will allow you to look around the modal. While holding right mouse button, you can also press WASD to fly around. So similar to Unity. And you can use Q and uh, E to go up and down if you need to travel uh, in that direction. If you need to focus on the model, just press F, and then Alt left click is going to allow you to uh, orbit around it. So we've got several generations, uh, like two of them, and we can pick, for example, for this one between these four variants. We want to keep it similar to the previous one on the opposite side. So let's see which one fits best. Um, that one had stone, not uh, wood, so I would say let's keep this one, for example. It's going to look the same. But this uh, variant looks darker than this generation. But remember what I said. We can right-click and make it brighter. For example, we can increase the value here or increase the contrast. So we can make the bright stuff brighter and dark stuff darker. In this case, I want to increase the value, so make everything brighter slightly. And also, maybe it's more saturated here. So for this variant, let's increase the saturation uh, a little bit, so something like that. And it looks a bit red. Here it also looks a bit red. But we could adjust the hue if we needed to make it purple or anything like that. Right click to reset. And uh, just coming back to the controls, Alt right mouse button and dragging it left and right allows us to zoom on the things. And of course middle mouse button allows us to pan left and right to just drag it around. And press F in case if you forgot or lost your model, you can't find it, press F and it will come into the view. Now we have two projections. One thing that I don't like is that there is a hard shadow on the door. So instead uh, of that, I'm going to pick, go into my 3D objects, and I'm going to only select the door itself. And I'm going to try to generate stuff just for the door itself. So with the door selected only, I'm going to go back into the art, and the textual description still fits. It says a dungeon door, so it's okay. Generate art. And you can see that stable projectors is generating just for the door itself. 
In fact, because the door is the only thing that's selected, uh, if I turn on the wireframe, you can see that it's the only thing. The arch is not selected and neither is uh, hinges or uh, anything else. If I go into the depth preview, you can see that this is exactly what's being sent to the stable diffusion. We are not sending the depth information about the arches and it really appears as if the door itself exists on its own. So we've just sent the information about the door like this. And that explains why it's uh, appearing different on the images. So the most important thing is that this harsh shadow that we had on the previous generation is gone. And if I turn off the wireframe, you can click between, um, between these things and pick whichever door fits us best. Keep in mind that it has to be similar to the opposite side. So we have stone in, around here. Maybe a kind of a stony door could be picked here as well. And you can fine tune the hue, saturation and value as needed. That way we were able to get rid of the hard shadow and still retain the projection coming for the arches. Now we have three generations and uh, we might want to clean up our workspace because we only using this image, this image and this image and the rest are not used. So we can click on the bucket here and it will delete everything that's not selected. Boom. And we only have three images that were selected remaining. Now let's look at the in-paint capabilities. We can click on the screen mask and uh, mask anything that we don't want to see. So in this case, remember that uh, I had only the door selected. It's important to go into the 3D object and to click select all or just control and click on them to pick all of them and make them selected. And hit shift W or hit on the wireframe just to confirm that everything is selected. Now we want to go and in-paint the stuff to force the projections to land only where I specify and want them to be. I'm going to hit screen mask and with a brush size of about that much, I'm going to start to paint uh, where I want our projections to land here, for example, and also here. The important thing about in paint is that while it's generating in this area, it will look around at the colors uh, around the model to get the idea of the style that we expect it to be in. So with this mask enabled, um, the in-paint, as you can see, has activated here. The stuff here is uh, good by default. You can Google about it, learn more about it. But by default, it's okay. And now we can click Generate Art. You can see that it's uh, generating four images. And if I jump into the art, we've got a new generation of four images here. And uh, they are going to be uh, projected specifically into this region here and here. I'm going to reset the mask to remove it. And I'm going to exit the screen mask mode because um, I want to paint on the object itself. While it's doing it, while it's creating the mask, or the projection inside of the mask, I'm going to turn off the wireframe, zoom up slightly, and with a smaller brush size, soft one, I'm going to start to paint here to brush away and make the transition easier and not as hard. I'm going to brush away here and also here. I can hold R to see exactly what I'm doing, to have the difference between the layers, to see them where they're meeting, here for example. And if I've erased too much, I can always change back to the white color and start to restore the projection as it used to be. So black subtracts and white restores. But I really want to have it like this. And with the black, I want to remove it from here and from here. So we've got the generation creating these four images. You can see that we can pick between four of them. And even though this one appears to be better in color, more suitable, remember that you can pick anything from here and fine tune using the hue and the saturation. So I can increase the saturation to be really high and then change the hue to something like more red, for instance. And that might actually be better in your case, but it depends on uh, what you currently have. Right now, it's actually indeed better to use this one because even without adjusting the hue and saturation, it already fits nice into here. Maybe let's just come into here and uh, adjust the blending slightly better between these two layers so that um, the blending occurs in a better way. Uh, because you have three different choices of brush, you have very hard one, which looks like so. You have smoother one and you have like a medium one you can uh, control the amount of uh, softness with which you're brushing. But it's also important to remember that your brush can have different strength. 
So right now, if you press one, two, three, four, five, six, up to zero on your keyboard, you're gonna be changing the opacity of your brush. By default, it's one, so 100%. And 100% you can do by pressing zero on your keyboard. 90% is nine, 80% is eight, and so on. So if I press two on my keyboard, I'm gonna be brushing with the very light strokes, so very gently. And this can help you to really um, make transitions even softer, even smoother. You can change between black and white, but you can also press X on your keyboard to flip between the brush um, colors, just like you would in Photoshop. And really just, you know, tap like here and uh, make it blend nicer. I've really just revealed the brick in here, and that's exactly what I want. You can keep fine-tuning your results so that they look better. Right now, I'm uh, with the red selected, I'm painting it away. Remember that anything that's highlighted in red is the one that you're currently brushing, and uh, I can improve it like so. If you need to remember from which direction you were uh, projecting this image, you can right-click it and restore the camera. That was the exact angle from where I've been painting my mask and from where I've re uh, requested the generation to occur. And you can do the similar stuff for any other uh, mask that you have. This one, for example, or the first one that we had that we generated from this angle. In the viewport, you can also press A and uh, D to jump between them, which might be a bit more convenient and comfortable. And also, if you have, for example, uh, this projection, uh, which belongs to this generation, you can make it to be beneath the other projection, so you can change its draw order by pressing W or S on your keyboard. It will push the entire generation to be uh, earlier in the draw order. So I've literally pressed S and moved this entire generation to be below everything else. And if I wanna restore it, uh, I can uh, press W on my keyboard and you can see that this layer has been brought up and is being drawn on top of everything. To learn about controls, you can uh, hover here and press on the question mark. It will list all of the controls that you can use. And if you have any questions, go into the stableprojectors.com and hit on the Discord button. You can also check out different videos in here of uh, me texturing the objects. If you scroll down, there's also additional tips that might help you to generate images even better. So now we've looked at generating the images, we've looked at general controls, we've looked at the screen mask, and now for the final boss, let's look at the most epic addition into the stable projectors, which is the backgrounds. The beauty of backgrounds is that once you generate them, the two-dimensional images, uh, they can be placed behind your models, and if you were to continue texturing your models, the texturing of the models is going to be looking around at the background and literally fusing your 3D model texture into the background, so it looks a lot more organic and so that your projections are going to be a lot more conforming and uh, complementary to each other, even if they are rendered from different directions. Without further ado, let's go and say a dungeon. Uh, remove the door, comma, warm lighting, hand-painted art station highly detailed. Everything else keeps the same. Let's go into the control net and disable the control net because we don't want to be giving any kind of depth information to the um, stable diffusion. Now you can see that we are not able to generate the art, but we are able to generate the backgrounds. And that's exactly what we want. We are generating the backgrounds, and in the backgrounds tab, you can see that we got four images being prepared for us. If you really wanted to, you could upload your own background, but I'm gonna wait for them to complete the generation and then see how it will affect the projections happening on my 3D model. We've uh, textured the model from here and from here, but not from this direction. I wanna place it like so and just uh, show you how it will uh, play out and be affected by the overall light of the image because it's quite beautiful and quite uh, unexpected in a good way. So I'm gonna hit generate art once again. You can already see that uh, the arc does really look like it's belonging to the entire background, which really helps you to maintain the art style uh, between different projections. Because as you're shining them onto the model, you'll typically find out that the projections look different from different angles. With the background enabled, it's gonna force it to become more or less the same, which means that you're gonna get more consistent projections from different angles for your 3D models. So right-clicking and restoring the camera, you can see that it indeed really fitted it into the background quite nicely. And of course, you can increase the hue and saturation 
uh, as necessary and the contrast as well if you feel that it's maybe a little bit unsaturated. So look at this beautiful result. It's so awesome. It looks like it's really belonging to the background, looking like it's been part of it. So if you were to use a background like this, you could uh, rotate and paint your object using this background as well, resulting in more consistent output. And just like that, quickly, we've generated a texture for um, our 3D model. We might want to export it by hitting this green save button. And uh, overall, the important settings here uh, with the minus and plus button, they control the total resolution of the entire 3D mesh. 2K is good by default, but if you really need, you can go up to 3K. So if I zoom up on the model, you can see that 3K just changes it ever so slightly. So 2K is already a good uh, variant. If you want to, you might want to reduce it down to 1K if you don't have a powerful computer. So 2K, uh, overall throughput, and hit save. Pick the location where you want to save it, and click save, which is going to output it to that folder. If you also have ambient occlusion, so if you baked it, when you hit save uh, and save your overall composition, entire images, it's going to be saved together with the ambient occlusion. So you're going to get two images saved to the same destination. One is going to be for the color and another one for the ambient occlusion. And uh, just one more thing, as I'm looking around the object, there comes to be a point where I see I want to fine tune this specific region here, but I can't remember exactly where this uh, projection is coming from. I want to fine tune this seam right here, but no matter as much as I paint it, uh, it doesn't get painted. That's because, first of all, the red selection is on the ambient occlusion, not on this layer. And second, I don't know which one it is. So I could press, uh, you know, A and D and try to recognize where it's coming from. I could try to orbit around and see which one magnifies to highlight that uh, it's the uh, appropriate one. But um, in this case, yeah, this one. But uh, in my case, uh, we can also hit the bucket to clean up all of the non-selected ones and then just hover with each one with the control being pressed on the keyboard. So you can see with the control exactly where they are and where they land. And as you can see, it's this one, because it lands here with a checker. And with it selected in red, with the brush, the black one, and the brush opacity is gonna be 100%. I'm gonna press zero or nine on my keyboard. I can start to paint it away. But in this case, we might need to do another projection specifically in here with the screen mask enabled like so. I'm gonna specify it right here. You know, I can send it off to be generated once again, specifically here with this background enabled. Reset the mask, turn off the mask, and maybe with a smaller brush size, fine tune it to be slightly better. X to change the brush color and uh, zero, one, two, three to change the brush strength. You can see that we can pick between different variants but uh, their current color is not indicative of the end result. So let's wait for it to generate. And then once it's done, we can pick whichever one we like. The beauty of the inpaint, uh, the screen mask, combined with the background, is that it's really paying attention to the colors of the surrounding projections, resulting in a much more organic look. But even if it's a little bit off, you can right-click and change the hue and the saturation as needed. And uh, with a slight brush, maybe like with 20%, you can paint it to make it even less noticeable, the transition. If it starts to generate something that you don't want, for example, it starts to put torches into here, you can always go into the screen mask, color this thing, and in the negative prompt, you can say that torch, light bulb, glowing, fire, and so on, and then generate which is going to ensure that uh, when it makes this mask or like fills it, that uh, it's not going to have anything glowing in there. Also, a word of warning or caution is that even if you are in the screen mask mode and let's say you've decided to erase the entire mask, it might appear that you have no mask at all. But that's not really true because it still considers as if there is some kind of mask applied. To ensure there is no mask, always make sure to hit reset mask and then exit the screen mask mode. That ensures that there is nothing orange painted on. You could uh, go through the modal and similar to this seam, you could uh, increase the details around this, for example, around the handle of the door, because right now the handle looks like so, and the actual color is slightly off. So you could mask it, draw a handle using the text description to get better results in here. 
you could do it from different angles, from different directions. And uh, as you're putting the object and texturing it, just make sure that it actually makes sense with the current background. Because if you have an object like so, then if you put it into the um, background like this, then Stable Diffusion is going to be saying, okay, this door is about two meters high, or maybe like one and a half meters high, so it's close to the window. Uh, and it's going to be able to produce reasonable textures. But if you, for example, make the door that big, then it might struggle and not really understand how to fit it into the composition. So pay attention to the backgrounds and the 3D models. Once you get the backgrounds, they are really part of your workspace, which will definitely affect how the lighting looks on the models. If you have a bright window here, for example, your textures are going to get highlight in here. So depending on whether you want highlights or not, you might want to have backgrounds that have lights or don't. In my case, I want to minimize the amount of lights because I'm creating the assets for the game. I want to have little of uh, highlights and instead I want to light the object in the uh, Unity engine itself. Once again, once everything is ready, I've got uh, these models selected. I'm going to click on the bucket and uh, get rid of anything else to clean up my working space. And I'm going to save to the file. If you really want to, you can bump it up to 3K, save it, and then uh, after you've saved it, you can reduce it back to 2K and keep working. So even if it's uh, like um, at 1K or maybe 512 or even 200, you can still work and make projections, uh, adjust them as needed. Maybe it's going to be more performant for your computer. But then right before saving, you can increase it back to like 2K or 3K, hit save, and uh, that way save performance for yourself. If you have a 2D game, then adjusting the FOV, the field of view, is going to help you. Because if you keep the field of view as 1, that's going to uh, make your object like orthographic. So it's easier for you to uh, generate images and might be more suitable for your game. Also, pay attention to the amount of surface that's visible to the projections if the field of view is little. So in orthographic mode like this, more of the object is exposed and more of it is visible. So technically, the uh, orthographic mode is better for generating the projections because you're covering more surface at once with each projection. But it might be a little bit awkward and clumsy for you to work with because we humans like to see, uh, you know, perspective. So maybe uh, 22, and let's hit F to focus on the modal. 22 or 24 could be a good trade-off. So it's comfortable to look at, and also projections uh, see a fair good amount of modal. Because you could go up to 90, press F to focus, and then you can see how poking through the window it is. But in reality, there is fewer surfaces, and they are coming at a shallow angle towards the projections. 22 is a good variant. And if you want to see what sort of depth you are submitting to the neural network via the control net, for example here, you can switch to the depth mode. And you can always tweak the depth intensity here and here to expose the more variation of black and white to give uh, the neural network a better idea about the details. Because if it's really wide, then the details might get lost. Although even with this range, it's usually okay. So if you increase you know, the minimum and reduce the maximum, it's going to be more contrasty. But be careful not to hide portions of your object. Uh, you still want to see the handle and the door uh, so that the neural network can pick up on it. But if you increase the minimum too much, you're going to start to cull through the modal, so be careful. By default, the default values are good. And if you want to do any kind of style transfer, you would enable a second control net unit, and from here you would pick something different, like maybe a, a style, and for the preprocessor you could pick a, like a open clip or something of that sort. If you have a preprocessor different to none, then um, a different preprocessor, when you hit generate, will force the black window to download extra stuff. So your generations might take a lot longer and you might think, okay, what's happening? Why no generations are being created? Well, that's because the web UI is downloading your preprocessor and then will start to generate images. It doesn't have to download it every single time, but if you've selected something new from here, then it will do it. its downloads. And of course, you can right-click here on the icon and select whether you want to submit the depth alone to this modal. No image. Maybe you have to provide your own custom file, like your own custom image that uh, is required, for example, for style transfer. 
uh, or you can pick uh, maybe whatever the view, the current view is. Maybe you want to submit it to this um, control net unit. But uh, in my case, I typically work just with one single control net unit. I can pick up the required artistic style from the background itself, and that usually suffices. Lastly, I'm going to be working on uh, creating updates for this program. So if you want to support me, you can click this button, or if you want to check out if there are any updates, click on the bottom right corner here and check for updates. It's going to list what the program currently has, what version there is, and if there are any updates available. Because I might be probably adding the soft masks so that once it's generated, you don't have to then come and manually brush it with a soft brush. So I'm going to add this probably very soon in the next update. So with this, I really hope that uh, it impressed you and happy asset generation. See you soon and good luck.